it's a good day to be in the house of the Lord. Hi everyone, my name is Nicholas Gonzalez. I'm the associate pastor here at St. Andrew. And on behalf of the Reverend Dr. Mark Rico, we're so thankful that you're joining us for our Sunday Word and Song, which includes our Sunday message, as well as a song from our traditional worship service, and some prayers and a blessing. If you want to learn more about the ministry of St. Andrew, head on over to our website, mystandrew.org, where you can learn about everything going on here at St. Andrew that happens by God's grace through all of you. We're currently in the season of Lent, and during Lent we have especially special worship service every Wednesday evening at 7 p.m. here in the sanctuary where we're walking through a series together called Journeys in the Wilderness. And we'll be doing that on Wednesdays and on Sundays as well and of course our Monday evening worship service. So if you're looking to join us in person, you can join us on Sunday mornings at 8, 9.30 or 11 a.m. or Monday evenings at 7 p.m. and then for our Lenten midweek services with a soup supper at 6 o'clock followed by worship at 7. I pray a wonderful blessing on your Lenten season and I look forward to seeing you soon. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 11th chapter. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent a message to Jesus, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. Rather, it is for God's glory, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, after, heard, after having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then, after he, this, he said to the disciples, Let us go to Judea again. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him while Mary stayed home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who believes and lives in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench because he has been dead four days Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone and Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out his hands and his feet bound with strips of cloth and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. This is the gospel of the Lord. In the name of Jesus, the Lamb of God, amen. This has nothing to do with the uh, sermon I'm about to preach, but uh, uh, what comes into my mind is that when I would visit uh, our son David at his college dorm room, I would sometimes quote John eleven thirty nine, 
Lord, there is already a stench. <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, in the posting that uh, we put up uh, this past week on social media, teasing you toward our worship services uh, this weekend, uh, there's an idiom, there's an expression uh, that is the term good grief, uh, which may call to mind the character of Charlie Brown in the Peanuts comic strip, uh, in which good grief uh, was an expression of uh, unpleasant surprise or uh, disappointment or uh, annoyance, and it's made its way into our language and our culture, of course, when we say things like, you know, good grief, my car won't start. Uh, and yet if you look at those two words together, side by side, uh, you can see the, the juxtaposition, the oxymoron, the contradiction in terms uh, that raises the question about whether grief can ever be good in any way, shape, or form. And yet, about 50 years ago, a man by the name of Granger Westberg, a Lutheran pastor, uh, wrote uh, a little book by that very same title, which is still very popular, in which he talks about uh, good grief as healthy grief. Uh, even though uh, grief is obviously very personal, it is uh, very complicated, it is very dynamic, it's very individual, and it can uh, certainly be very painful. And that brings us uh, to today's uh, journey through the wilderness, this being the wilderness of loss and of grief, and what it means to navigate through that wilderness as a follower of Jesus. And so on one hand, uh, you know, you've got the story of John and Mary, uh, who were a couple, and uh, they weren't religious at all, but they traveled to Jerusalem to visit some friends, and in Jerusalem, John suddenly died. And uh, so they said to Mary, well, we can bury John uh, right here in Jerusalem for $1,000, or it'll cost you 10000 to bring him back home. And, and Mary said, well, I'll pay the 10000 And they said, well, okay, but it's much less expensive here. And besides, then John is buried in the holy city. And Mary said, oh no, I heard that there was a guy who died and was buried in Jerusalem, and he came back to life three days later. And I am not taking that chance. <laughs> it's a terrible story, but I keep telling it. On the other hand, uh, grief can be absolutely excruciating, debilitating, and an intensely painful response to the losses that we experience in life, whether that's the death of somebody that we love, or it's the end of a relationship, or it's a move that you make, or it's some other uh, difficult, uh, dramatic, or major change in your life. Uh, people who know me know that one of my mantras is, transition always begins with loss, even when it's kind of a good one. Something still has to go. And so navigating through the wilderness of transition and, and of loss and of grief is uh, not only vital to our spiritual health, it's, it's vital to our mental health, our emotional health, and even our physical health. Because at the end of the day, there are really two kinds of people in this world, those who have experienced grief and those who will. And so with the backdrop of the death and raising of Lazarus in John chapter 11, I'd like to share some thoughts with you about what good grief might look like in your life and about what it means to navigate through that wilderness and maybe even help the people around you uh, to navigate a little bit through theirs. And, and the first thing that I would say right off the bat is that contrary to the perceptions of a lot of uh, people, uh, not just outside of our faith, but even within our faith, grief is not a sign that uh, your faith is somehow weak or that it isn't as strong as you think it, it ought to be. And, and the reason I say that is that I've even heard myself describing people in grief uh, by saying things like, you know, they're really doing well because their faith is so strong. When the fact of the matter is that your faith may be strong and you may be doing good, but that doesn't mean that you're not grieving. Uh, just before Christmas last year, uh, the wife of a pastoral colleague, a friend, a mentor of mine passed away suddenly and the funeral was like actually on the morning of Christmas Eve. And so when I got the news, I called him in Florida and then a couple of weeks later I called him again and I said, you know, how you doing? And his answer was terrible. Now this is a pastor who has 
proclaim the resurrection, who has brought people the comforts of the gospel hundreds of times in the course of his ministry. And yet he said to me, you know, I know all the answers and I believe it all. It just feels awful. And so maybe Roy and Anne, you know, they had a little closer relationship than, you know, John and Mary back in Jerusalem. As he reflected uh, the words of Britain's Queen Elizabeth, uh, who I love to quote and who famously said that grief is the price we pay for love. You know, no love, not a lot of grief. Lots of love, then maybe lots of grief. And uh, so if you or still need to be convinced that grief is not an absence of faith, then just consider the story of Mary and Martha in John chapter 11, who were absolutely overwhelmed by grief at the death of their brother Lazarus. And yet they believed in Jesus. They believed that he is the Messiah, the one who has come into the world. And it says it right there. Uh, the people who were in the house with Mary and Martha in Bethany, just outside the city of Jerusalem, believed in Jesus, and yet they were filled with grief, and the house was filled with weeping. And then comes the shortest verse in the Bible, but also one of the most important verses in the Bible, when Jesus finally arrives at Bethany, and he is overcome by the grief that he sees and begins to experience over the death of his good friend, Lazarus. So that John reports to us that even Jesus begins to weep. And the word in Greek actually uh, indicates that he is sobbing. I mean, he is broken down. And this is the resurrection and the life talking here. This is the Lord of life but he's also your brother who cries with you when you cry because he knows the power of death and loss and what Queen Elizabeth called the pain of love. So number one, grief is not the absence of faith. Grief is the price I pay for love. And there's something that St. Paul uh, wrote in his first letter uh, to the church in the northern Greek city of Thessalonica uh, when he talks about grief in the context of our faith. And he says this beautiful thing. He says, we have sorrow, but not as people who have no hope, which I think is a fundamental difference between good grief and not good grief. We have sorrow, even as people of faith, but not as those who have no hope. Another thing to remember is that good grief is expressed grief. It is shared grief, which gets communicated and shared in some uh, healthy ways because, as the old saying goes, a sadness shared is a sadness divided. I mean, it's not eliminated, it's not a, invalidated or obliterated, but it is divided when it is shared. And our tears are one of the ways that we share our grief, which is very clear in John chapter 11. But it's also clear that those in grief have been invited by God to put words on their grief, words on the story of their loss, which is also clear in John chapter 11, when members of the crowd and also the sisters Mary and Martha both speak of their grief when Jesus arrives on the scene, and they both say essentially the same thing. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And yet because we know some things about Mary and Martha from other passages of Scripture, the music behind those words may have been different, even though the words were essentially the same, because Mary had, you know, the sensitive, soft heart, and Martha was the problem sol solver who was very direct, and she cut to the chase, like, if you would have been here, the brother wouldn't have died. And yet Jesus is there for both of them. He is present to both of them, because he can take our grief Whatever it is, whatever our feelings may happen to be. So that we can pour out our grief in the petitions of our hearts. We can name our grief in our conversations with people in our lives who give us a safe place to divide our sadness by sharing our sadness with each other.
And so sometimes uh, when I meet people who I know are grieving, I will uh, not say to them or to you, you know, hey, how you doing or how's it going? But I will literally say, as some of you know, hey, how, how's the grieving going? Because it names it and it gives permission and it opens up the, the door if they want to walk through it so that they don't feel like they have to give you the answer that, that you want them to give, which is, you know, I'm, well, I'm good, doing good, I'm okay, or I'm hanging in there, which, which may also be true. But the point is that if grief is not shared, if it is not expressed, if it is not laid at the foot of the cross, if it is not put out there somewhere, it can go sideways and it can have a strain on our relationships. It can rob you of your joy. It can prevent you from opening up the next chapter in your life and, and beginning uh, to move on. It can even make you sick physically. It's like when there's a bulge in a balloon. I mean, you can press it down. It's just going to bulge up somewhere else until you let it out. And thanks be to God, we have a place to let it out and to put our grief, our sorrow, our loss, our heartache, and our pain at the foot of the cross, in the petitions of our hearts, in our conversations with one another, including sisters and brothers who give us a safe place to navigate through the wilderness of grief. And uh, by the way, uh, it's also true, as we've heard many times from many dif different people, that grief is not an event, it is a process. Longer in some situations, shorter than in other situations, more intense, sometimes less intense at other times. Uh, when we moved out of our house years ago into our new house that we now have lived in for some time, you know, there was grief. And I still remember that moment, you know, when I pulled that door closed for the very last time. There was grief about leaving that house, that cul-de-sac, that neighborhood, where so many good things happened. And yet there was also a sense of adventure about what was yet to come. Uh, some of you who have been around here for a while uh, may have felt that way when we left our old church house down on George Avenue to come here. And both of those things just kind of sat there side by side. When uh, my friend Tom left a ministry in Florida and he came up to uh, Virginia, I asked him, you know, if he was grieving his uh, former ministry and, uh, and if he missed it. And he, he smiled and he says, well, I, I, I miss the good parts. <laughs> you know, it's a fair enough. You know, when adult uh, children uh, lose their parents or their grandparents. You know, that's a certain kind of grief. When parents lose their children, that's a very different kind of grief because it's out of sequence. It's in reverse. When uh, someone loses a spouse, that's a certain kind of grief. When a marriage ends in divorce, that's a different kind of grief because that other person's still out there walking around somewhere. We are told that funerals are harder for pastors who stay a while in the congregations they serve because they're not just helping others to move through the process of good grief, they're also grieving themselves. And don't I know it. Which leads me to my third thought for the fourth Sunday in Lent, which is that St. Paul was right and that we are people of hope. And people of hope are people of Easter, and people of Easter are people who know that in the wilderness of grief, there will be a happy ending. For Mary and Martha, it was the raising of their brother Lazarus in the village of Bethany, which uh, we will hear about again in two weeks when we come to celebrate Palm Sunday, uh, when that moment really brought a crowd of people out to Bethany when Jesus entered into the city of Jerusalem where he died and rose again for an eternally happy ending for all of God's children. Like I said a couple of weeks ago, raising of Lazarus was great, and it did show the glory of God, just like Jesus said, but it was still temporary. Lazarus still eventually died, and there were still tears to be shed. What Jesus gives to you and me is way bigger, way better than that. He gives us a family reunion, and a happy ending that will last 
for an eternal lifetime. Psalm 30 says, weeping may last for a night, but joy comes in the morning, and that night may be very long for you on our earthly calendar. But the end of the story is joy forever with him. And when I know that, and I believe it, and I trust it, just like my friend does in the midst of his grief, then I can look through the wilderness, I can look past the wilderness, I can look beyond it, I can look over the horizon and know the joy for which Christ has given his life so that I may live in the reunited family of God for all eternity. So I've shared with some of you uh, that in my office, uh, there's a cross that hangs uh, on the wall just above my desk. Now, if you've been to my office, you know that I, I got a lot of crosses in my office, but this one is off by itself because this particular cross was in my father's casket. Uh, and it was given to me before it was closed and we went off to the uh, cemetery uh, that day. And uh, for a long time, I kept that cross in a box in a cabinet at home. And uh, I knew it was there but I would rarely look at it. And then, you know, there was a time when I took it out and I opened the box and I looked at it. And I mean, the tears would start to flow because I would think of him and I would think of his death. And so I'd close it up and I'd put it back and see, I'm telling my story. And uh, then uh, some time went by and I would open it up and I'd look at it and you know, the, the tears were not coming. And then finally I, I opened the box one day and I took out that cross and I put it in my bag and I brought it to the church and I hung it uh, on the wall because it was okay. And what I'm saying to you in that is that, you know, it's, it's not that I don't think about him. It's not that I don't miss him. It's just that I'm not in the wilderness anymore uh, because I know that my grief was not an absence of my faith. I know that I had a place to express my grief. I know there's a happy ending. And we're going to celebrate that happy ending on the day of resurrection. I also like that cross uh, for two other reasons. One is I know he picked it out because he made his own funeral arrangements, which included the selection of that cross in particular. And the second reason is that uh, while it is a cross reminding me of the death of Jesus for our life in Christ, it is not a crucifix, which is to say that like the cross above our altar here at St. Andrew, it is known as the Christus Victor because the image is, is of Jesus alive, victorious, triumphant, in the resurrection so that all of us can navigate through the wilderness and on to the glory of God forever and ever and ever. And so I pray that uh, God will give you the grace to navigate through the wilderness of grief and loss and transition in your life because you know he is with you, he loves you, he is the resurrection, and in him, the final word is life. And if by chance, I happen to die in Jerusalem, <laughs> tell Patty to save her money. <laughs> because I will rise again. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
as we close today. I invite you to join me in the prayer that our Lord has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And receive the Lord's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.